Well, this is going to be an absolutely hard act to follow here. <laughs> so uh, you will see that many of the concepts that Dan presented are the same drivers that we have in my group. And really what we're looking at is agriculture that we have today is really going to need to change to address the agriculture, the increased productivity that we're going to need in the future. In fact, climate change is, is really driving the need to accelerate the germplasm that we're going to be looking at to either deal with whether it's drought, disease pressures, lack of water, and we want to really do this in a sustainable way. And what I'm thinking now is we really come to this pivotal point where biology is really able to advance that agriculture in a way that we really couldn't do that before. And this is really due to the changing of the technology landscape. We had a talk earlier today by the speaker about robotics making things smaller. This is really accelerating the rate by which we can actually produce data sets that can help us build these biological models. These enabling technologies are giving us our reference genome. They're allowing us to actually monitor the physiology of the plant at a rate that we could not do that before. In addition, we have fabulous genetic resources, both the ones that are historical, that represent natural variation. In addition, we can make now, in a way, and test hypothesis, structured populations that can actually give us much more additional insights in the functions of these genes. And when we think about a phenome, it's really, I think of it as a complex trait. And if I talk to a breeder, there's only one trait that's important, it's yield. Yield, 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 all right? But you can start to break down yield into minor, comp smaller components. And when we think about it, these smaller components are the interaction of these many genes, which we just heard from Dan. And in fact, many times it isn't a brand new gene. It's about the temporal spatial changes of where and when that gene is happening that is giving us the insights into those quantitative traits. So what I'm going to be telling you about is some of the work that my group has been doing in the last few years. And this has all been a collaboration with many other groups. So many people know that I actually come from the maize community. And my group was one of the groups involved in the sequencing of the first maize genome. And what I can tell you that's changed since then is the speed at which we're receiving the data and the opportunities that this actually allows. So in my group, 10 years ago, it was $50 million to make a maize genome. I'm going to tell you I have 27 packed biogenomes that we're going to have ready and available at the end of this year. And they're running about, depending, I'm not going to say exactly, they're a lot cheaper. The most important point to think about is it's now actually the compute to assemble those and to give us the information content in the genome, the, the genes, the structures, that actually is the most costly. And this is where compute becomes really important. So that's all I'm going to say about maize, but just the teaser, 27 genomes. Pretty cool. OK, I'm going to talk to you about sorghum. And actually, sorghum is a really great model, and it's a great model for maize, and it's a great model for maize because there's less complexity in the genome. So that when we're trying to actually look at gene function, we have a lot less buffering, a lot less duplication that we see in sorghum. So it makes it an excellent model for some of the things I'm going to be talking about. So I work really closely with the Cropping System Research Lab in Lubbock, Texas, that's been working on sorghum for years. It's a fabulous group of breeders, physiologists, geneticists who are working on this model. We have a really lovely exchange program where uh, the postdocs go down. They spend anywhere from a year, six months, or just maybe a few weeks um, during uh, the field season. And they're interacting directly with the um, group down there. And what we've been focusing on the last few years is working with uh, Dr. Zheng Guo Jin, who developed a large-scale sorghum EMS population. And what many of you may not know, that breeders for a long time have been introducing natural variation into their existing crops using EMS, because you can actually trans, you can put in this engineered variation and it doesn't count as a GMO. So this is a way that we basically had been creating novel variation in many of the crop plants that we've been working on. And what we've worked with Zhang Guo is he's developed this nice population. He has pools. He's made DNA from it and continues to phenotype it. And what we were able to do then is index those mutations. And so we now know in the pools of seeds which novel variations are there right now.
And what we found is that he introduced about 2 million novel variations in the, in the germplasm that we're working about. Each plant has about 8,000 mutations, and about half of the genes have potentially a mutation that could actually have a fitness consequence. When we look at this, these variations don't look like any of the variations that we see in um, the existing germplasm we were able to look at. Now, this is an example of, of one of the example uh, phenotypes. And actually, it's really fun to walk through these fields. So what you see here is something called an erect leaf. And if you're thinking from an engineering perspective, this plant now can actually have uh, many more plants can grow. I'm a little bit more dense. I actually have better solar. Right? I can capture more energy with this. So this is an example where we have an agronomic trait that's actually going to increase the amount of yield because of the planting density and potentially also solar capture. We also have many other interesting phenotypes that have to do with biomass, grain yield, grain quality, conversion efficiency, as well as water use efficiency. And what I'm going to be telling you is some stories about two of these traits, multi-seed and also um, bloomless, is water use efficiency. So in this example, I have about a third of, a, of the flower fertility is increased in this mutant, and it's a result of single nucleotide um, mutations. In this case here in sorghum, it turns out usually um, the plant only has one of the flowers that are uh, fertile in the sessile. Um, the sessile and the participle spikelet is not fertile. And what we see here is in this mutation, all of the flowers are fertile. And then also we have increasing in branching as well. This was a recessive mutation, and we could use a bulk segregate analysis to actually identify the mutation. And this is where these technologies and the computes have really helped, because we can now sequence through things in ways that we couldn't do before. It turns out that we were able to um, identify basically um, basically background mutations, because it turns out the BTX623 um, that we're using has additional um, mutations in it or variations that the BTX623 that was sequenced here has, so we can remove background noise, and then we can actually look for segregations of the variations that are associated with the causative allele. So what she did when she looked at this, she actually had F2 pools that she was working with. She had coverage of the background of the BTX we were working with. And then we had 17 independent alleles. And we were really fortunate when we looked at the convergence of the genes that were associated with the mutations she called, we narrowed it down to uh, one gene. And that gene has seven independent alleles. And the really beautiful part about this is that six of the um, alleles are all in a functional domain that was previously identified, and there was one loss of function. This TCP domain um, is associated with a transcription factor, and I'll tell you a little bit more. We were able to validate that this was the cause of allele by segregation of, of, the, um, of the variations to demonstrate that this was actually the gene. Now, this was interesting to us because the TCP transcription factor is a class of, of proteins that many of us in the grasses are very, very familiar with. It turns out that they are associated with um, the major domestication loci, teosinte branched. And in fact, teosinte branched played a major role in domestication. It was the insertion of a transposon in this in teosinte, and then the rapid selection of that that led to basically the nice corn that we have, the modern corn that's upright and not branching. Well, when we looked at the mutations that we have, it turns out that none of these are, are, are things that you find in nature, and they're all in the conserved domains. And so it's, it's really nice to see that as we're looking at this, this also gives us very predictive value that if we know something's in a functional domain, and it has potentially a, a change that could impact the amino acid structure, there's a very good chance it's going to have a fitness impact on the protein. That fitness impact in some cases could be better, but in most of the cases it's, it's, um, it's usually having a, a negative effect. Now, Young Kong Lee and my group, we were starting to try to understand the biological model associated with this, and there really wasn't a good developmental scan of, of sorghum. So she actually used scanning electron microscopy to actually identify um, sizes of the meristem associated with each stage and it correlated those with leaf number. And this set the foundation for some additional work. We also came up with a really beautiful clearing protocol that we could actually see the differences between the um, reproductive tissues and the pedicillin 
this little spikelet, which you see here on the top, it's not developing, but if you see down below, you see the ovaries and anthers developing in, in the mutate. And here's a nice picture of this with its clear. So when she wanted to then to find out, where is this gene expressed? So she used QPT, um, qPCR and she looked across tissues, and it turns out that this was expressed just in the, um, the inflorescence material. Our next step was to think about, um, let's understand the biological model. So we're going to use transcription profile to look at differences of the genes. And what was really nice to see is that in the stage four, the difference between the pedicipal spikelet and the sessile spikelet is where we see the most changes. They were really huge. And you could understand why this is, because in, 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 in one of the flowers, there's, there's no um, embryo there. And in the other one, there's everything is, 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 is there. Now, um, this was a lot of work to produce these libraries in this tissue, but it was, it was very, very encouraging. The top regulated genes were all associated with seed development. So what Yiping and, and Young wanted to do is they developed a model, um, and they had a hypothesis that said that um, this transcription factor was acting as a suppressor. And that what we would expect is we would see more of this gene in the pedicipal spikelets than we see in the sessile spikelets. And so what Yiping did is she developed a model that basically was looking for a certain pattern of genes um, between the mutant and, and the wild type. And the expectation was that in the pedicipal spikelets, genes that were being uh, regulated by this transcription factor would now have the same expression pattern. And when she looked at this in the data, what she actually identified was 167 genes that followed this pattern. And what was like really, really amazing, this was like the cleanest data we have ever seen. It turns out the top 10 enriched um, ontologies were associated with a plant hormone, desmonic acid. Well, this plant homo hormone has been associated with many different things from defense, response to environment, and development. And in rice, it had previously been associated with spikelet development. So this is the jasmonic pathway that was um, that, uh, coming from um, a paper in 2016. And what we were able to find was several other of our alleles in our population were associated with some of the biosynthetic genes in the pathway of jasmonic acid. So we have now a working hypothesis that jasmonic acid is actually um, causing the infertility in the pedicipal spikelets. So based on that, we actually uh, collaborated with um, a USDA researcher um, to look at the jasmonic acid levels. And what we ended up seeing is, yes, indeed, in the, in the mutant, we have less uh, jasmonic acid. Nick Gladman, a postdoc in the group, then wanted to explore uh, whether he can rescue this by adding um, jasmonic acid. And indeed, when he looks at this phenotype, um, if you look at the wild type and the mutant that's been um, treated with jasmonic acid, you see a reversion to the wild type phenotype. We could also find that in the biosynthetic gene, this was also true, that if we treat it with jasmonic acid, we could rescue the phenotype. And this shows you the treated mutant and the untreated mutant. So we now have basically a nice model that says high expression of this transcription factor will lead to abortion and the lack of it will lead to fertility. Now, transcription factors are known to, homeo, um, to actually work together, and he was able to demonstrate that this transcription factor in vivo actually works together with itself, and he tested it with two other paralogs in the tree, and it works with that. We also were able to demonstrate that this gene, using a yeast-1 hybrid approach, could actually bind to the promoter of itself as well as another of the biosynthetic genes in the pathway. So we have a nice um, potential um, circuit being set up here. When he looks at genes in those pathway, in the pathway for jasmonic acid, he sees enrichment of JA as well. And more recently, we've been able to um, use DAP-seq. He actually went through the work of developing an antibody to the transcription factor, but DAP-seq ended up making it much easier. And we were able to demonstrate beautiful peaks that are binding to the five prime portion of these um, in front of the genes or in the first entron for many of these. So I'm going to quickly move on and basically tell you we're able to use this population for both forward and reverse genetics. 
In Arabidopsis, we have information in priors of potential genes that are involved in, on, in wax biosynthesis. And we were able to go and look in the population, and we were able to identify five different um, pools that would have this, and of those, three of them actually had demonstrated that they have mutations, and we were then able to show um, that there was no wax associated in those mutations. We're also able to use a forward genetic approach, we have many of these, and take a look at it as well. And what we ended up finding is additional alleles in uh, a cutin synthase gene using the same approach as MSD2, which would end up being uh, a change in a splice site donor, in addition to a change from an alanine to a threonine in a very conserved domain. So what I hope you took away from this is that this is a really a, a great and efficient system for actually looking at gene function. But what I want to shift to the last part of this is talk about gene networks. And I'm going to actually talk to you about gene networks uh, associated with nitrogen use efficiency. And this has been a long-standing collaboration with Xiaobon Brady's group um, from when she was a postdoc to, um, in Phil Benfi's lab to now as, as a faculty member at UC Davis. It's also uh, part of this work was funded by Pioneer DuPont, now Corteva, and we had an excellent relationship with both Shen and Mary Frank. So nitrogen is, is both an essential macro, macronutrient, but also um, not enough of it has a fitness impact, and too much of it is really a problem for the planet. We have problems with runoff and, and, the, and runoff of the nitrogen that creates the pollutant. Now, it turns out that um, nitrogen metabolism um, was demonstrated by Gloria Carusi's group at NYU to actually be transcriptionally responsive and that nitrate is the most common source. So what we were working on is we were using a yeast one hybrid approach to develop a regulatory network. And how this works is we have a transcription factor library that we generated that was indexed. We have 700 transcription factors um, that are known to be expressed in root. And then we generated promoters for uh, the genes that might be associated with nitrogen metabolism. And we're basically using this to fish out transcriptional regulators of these genes. This was a lot of work. So we now have this beautiful network um, associated with transcription factors that are regulating uh, genes associated with nitrogen metabolism. But now that you have this, what do you do? I mean, this is a nice start, but we want to test this. So Christoph, um, a postdoc in the group, wanted to develop a model where he could integrate the data from the network with expression data, and then basically use an approach to rank these genes to, for testing hypothesis. And, excuse me, um, and the approach he was using was basically to use the topology of the network in addition to expression data and co-expression data to look at this. So for the topology of the network, um, uh, he was basically looking at um, the centrality, the transitivity, and the connectivity. And to build this model, we had a really good data set of cell-sorted um, expression in Arabidopsis. And we had genes that we knew that were associated with different tissue types. So he's empirically tweaked which of the rankings he would like to use on this. In addition, he basically used two different um, methods, an intersection union test and a tissue selectivity index, to basically um, define um, which genes were associated with either, a, in this case, it's a tissue, but in, in other cases, we can also use it for uh, treatment. He then wanted to look at co-expression, so he used a Gini correlation to take a look at this and to basically be able to provide a score and a rank. Then he basically was able to combine this into a linear model where he takes these, um, these uh, five different parameters. And then we're able to basically use a process to um, provide a score based on the condition. So he initially trained these with the really good um, data sets that we had from cell sorting. And now we're applying this to nitrogen use efficiency network that we have. So we were able to take the public data sets and we were, as for nitrogen, um, and nitrogen, um, excuse me, that were available in the public for nitrogen, we had about 60 or 70 samples, and he was able to apply that. 
We then get a rank for the transcription factors in the network. And what we did is we uh, took the top 43 um, genes that we could find tDNA insertions in them. And these, um, excuse me, the top genes, and it ended up being 38 genes that we looked at. And then Allie in Xiaobaon's lab did an amazing job of phenotyping these. She phenotyped them for a root phenotype for primary length and, and also um, lateral lateral roots under limiting and sufficient nitrogen. And what she was able to find is she could find transcription factors that were affected in both limiting and non-limiting condition on the primary roots. And she found examples of the arid transcription factor that was only impacting a phenotype, um, only impacting the phenotype under regular normal conditions. Also looked at shoot phenotyping, rosettes of 15 days and 22 days. And this is really a proxy for biomass. She looked at bolting, which is a, a, a proxy for the transition from vegetative to reproductive tissues, which if you're a nitrogen limiting may make a difference to you, as well as flowering time. And this was published, and if you want to, you can look at more data about this. It was published at the end of the year. But the important point is that she ends up having uh, 26 of the mutants that we looked at of 36 have a phenotype. And for those of you who've been working, this is really a highly predictive number to see this. Really, really highly predictive. So we think that we have a nice way to rank and score things um, with these regulatory networks. She has one example here where we have uh, three of these um, transcription factors that are actually regulating several parts of the pathway. And what we were able to take a look at is we're starting to now think about, well, some of these genes that we've looked at in Arabidopsis can we actually see impacts in something like sorghum? And I don't know why this is speeding up. And what we were able to find is that one example here, um, yes, a first pass we haven't validated. We certainly see segregating phenotypes in the pools. So we think that we'll be able to apply this directly for our other crops. Now, the data from the CMS population is available and released through Grameen. You can search it. You can prioritize your genes either by the gene you know, by a pathway. And then you can actually identify the line. You can see what the allele is. And then you can order it. OK, this is an example of, of, a, of an additional line. You can order it from Dr. Zhang Jin. She makes these available for the community. And what I'm really excited to tell you about is Jenny Mortimer from JBay actually requested an additional um, proposal for sequencing of additional mutants. So we think that we're going to be able to expand out the number of lines um, that have index mutations here and the number of genes. The other thing that um, we've been working on is, is the idea of making data fair. And what you're going to see coming soon is a reproduction of the expression analysis that you saw in this paper we'll have available as a public narrative in KBase for you. All right. So I just would like to thank um, the people. I tried to, um, to thank them as we go along. Young is, is now in a position um, in Korea, um, uh, the equivalent of USDA. Christoph works at Bayer. Uh, Yiping is moving on to her own lab in China this summer, and Nick is finishing up on his work. This has been an excellent collaboration uh, with Jango Jin's group, as well as Xiaobao and Grady's group. Okay. I do have, I have a question. I have a question about your last slide. Um, I guess they don't want this to be redundant. I'll just make, oh, I'll, I'll switching now. See, AV is tricky. Uh, so this this concept of making data fair and making the narrative available through KBase. Can you say? a little bit more about why you think that's an important thing I, to do. I think this is really important because it's an opportunity for people to have reproducible workflows. It also allows other community members to actually run the same exact workflow um, on their own data sets. It provides us an opportunity to share that 
those data to be more useful. You can see in my example here, I wouldn't have been able to run that nitrogen use efficiency model if I did not have access to those expression data sets of the community member. That just wouldn't have been tractable for me. But this allows us the opportunity to actually bring data together for everybody to be able to reutilize and reutilize um, much more effectively. It took us a long time to curate those data sets. But if we have it in a way that we can share it together, I think it's going to make our science and our outcomes much more powerful.